Good morning. What a great way to start the morning. It's, not, it's only 9.02, and look what we've already got to experience. So very grateful for the gifts and talents demonstrated this morning. Um, look, Mike Stallings plays the trumpet as well. You just never know, do you? Um, we, we are in the midst of a series called Awaken. John Wesley and the Wesleyan, um, and the Wesley, the Methodist movement. And part of that in this service weekly is we will be singing hymns that Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother, wrote. And so that is what we go to next is a good Charles Wesley hymn. Please stand to worship God.
we now, now gather to affirm our faith. And one of the things that I like to remember when we affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed, how this is what has been affirmed for generations. And today, across the world, Christians, Christians in all types of places will affirm our faith through this creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Concord, thanks for joining us for worship today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please text WELCOME to 865-302-3616. New to Concord and wanting to learn more? It's time to take your next step. Join us for our next Connect to God and Concord group, which is an introduction of who we are and what we believe. This group meets Sundays for four weeks beginning April 14th from 10 to 1050 in the Fellowship Hall. Our next Deeply Rooted group begins meeting Wednesday, April 17th from 11 to 12.30 p.m. in the Worship Center classroom. Deeply Rooted is our study of Scripture using the inductive method. We will be reading the Book of Romans from April 17th through May 22nd. Help Missions continue feeding our neighbors by joining us on Wednesday, April 17th starting at 4.15 p.m. as we bag soup mix. Helpers five years and older are needed to assist in the soup mix line. The more people, the better. We will work until 5.30 to 5.45 when the community care night meal begins. The Tennessee Taco Soup Mix will be shared as a complete meal kit at local food pantries. For more information, go to concordunited.org forward slash events. Thanks for joining us for worship. We hope you will take advantage of these opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. It really is a beautiful day to gather here and worship and sing praises to our living Lord. We are celebrating the, the early Methodist movement and singing the hymns of Charles Wesley. I don't know if you know, but Charles Wesley wrote over 6,500 hymns. That's a lot of writing. I don't know if I would have time to do all that in my lifetime. We are so glad you're here. We're glad you're joining us online. If you would, if you're online, please sign in and let us know. If you're here in person, hopefully you received a connection card as you came in, just a chance for us to get to know you, update your information. Also, there's a place on the back of the card to list your prayer requests and concerns. I know our staff looks at those every week and they gather together and dutifully pray for you and, and all your needs that we have here as a church family. Um, if this is your first time here, uh, we'd like for you to text the word welcome to 865-302-3616. We promise not to spam you, but it's just a chance to, to get to know you a little bit. And if you have any questions about ministries or activities going on here at Concord, and there are lots of ministries and lots of activities to get involved with, we'd like to let you know about them. If you're here in person for the first time, we do have a welcome gift for you at our, at our information booth. If you'll go out the back of the sanctuary and take a right, one of our lovely volunteers there will be happy to give you your first time gift. Uh, as we go into our, our time of, of giving our tithes and our offerings uh, to God, his tithes and our offerings, we want to celebrate that we have given over, this, this church family has given over $8,000 in our Easter offering for the New Voices campaign. The Holston Conference's New Voices campaign goes to support our church colleges, 
campus ministries and camping ministries. So we are very thankful that this congregation was willing to give so, so generously to that, to that cause. Here at Concord, to give God's tithes and our offerings to him, we have four ways that you can give. Of course, you can give in person by dropping it in, your offering in the, in the boxes in the back of the sanctuary. You can go online to concordunited.org slash give, or you can text or use regular mail. As a recognition of all the great blessings that God has given to us, let us stand and sing the doxology. Please be seated. Tuesday night, I was here. I had a meeting. I was part of a retreat that included meeting here at the church as part of our provisional um, cohort. And it was amazing what was going on here on a regular Tuesday evening. Well, Haley would probably tell you it wasn't a regular Tuesday evening, was it? How many folks did we have involved in Nemo? A bunch. 50 or 60 children, youth, tech support involved in Nemo, which was the musical that our kids and youth um, performed on Wednesday night to approximately 500 people in the worship center. But on Tuesday night was the dress rehearsal. That was going on. We had leadership council over here. We had recovery meetings. We had groups meeting. It was just amazing to get to be witness to what God is doing in the midst of the life of this community of faith and just wanted to acknowledge that on a regular Tuesday evening, God was showing out once again in so many ways and we give thanks for that. We also acknowledge today that there is a lot going on in the world and in our community, a lot of conflict. And so today, as we go to God together in prayer, we remember the goodness that we experience in the routine of our lives and the conflict that exists within our own relationships and relationships around the world and all that stuff in between. And what better can we do than take it to God? So let us pray. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we do come to you today in the routine of our lives. Those things that may seem mundane or we just do them and we don't think much about them. May we give thanks for you, to you, for all those opportunities, for the things that take place here on a routine Tuesday, yet are anything but routine. They provide connection to you and to others. We give thanks for that. We give thanks for your ever presence in our lives. In those moments of crisis, those moments where we find ourselves in doubt and disconnection from you, and yet you never leave us, never. Even in the depths of this most silent of silence, you are present, and we give thanks for that. We also lean into that today about how in the place of crisis of faith, in the midst of our powerlessness, there is your love. Thank you for that. Lord, we come to you today. 
heads bowed. There's a lot we don't understand about the conflict that takes place in our world. And our hearts are broken by the devastation to life and property. Lord, move us to a place that reflects your love. May we never forget that you called us, that you told us your greatest commandment is to love you and love others. May we do that in the midst of our relationships. May we do that in interceding for others in their conflicts. Lord, may we be found faithful to you first and foremost, the creator and savior of all. Lord, now we go to you in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We are in the midst of a series, and whenever we talk about series, I once had someone come up to me and say, I, I don't know what to do. I missed the first week, and I'm not going to be able to be here the next couple. What do I do? And I'm like, you just keep showing up. Even though we call it a series, you can just come whenever you can, and you're going to be good. So if you're thinking, I missed last week, it's okay. We'll catch you up. You'll understand today. We are in the midst of a series called Awakened, and it's a focus on John Wesley and the Methodist movement. But what we know is it's not about Wesley. The focus isn't Wesley in the movement. Wesley in the movement came out of this revival that was sparked by God. I have literally been asked at times as a Methodist pastor if I worship John Wesley. Yeah, I know. I try to be respectful and I want to laugh too, but um, <laughs> I sometimes pull it together. Um, and and it's, that's the thing. We don't worship Wesley. He's not our God. God is our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, Wesley is an incredibly quirky guy. He gives us hope because we're like, ah, he is flawed like the rest of us. And yet, for in the 1700s, what Wesley did in the, what the Methodist movement did, which we are a part of as a United Methodist Church, is important for us to know and to understand. And if you want to be part of a discussion group about that, at 10 o'clock on Sundays, started last week, it's not too late to join, um, through the Sunday, I think it's May 19th, we are meeting and discussing this where we get an opportunity as well as some of our other groups. If you're interested, that group, if you're not part of a group and you're like, I'd kind of like to dip my toe, we're meeting in the fellowship hall at 10 o'clock. We'd love for you to come. We will talk about, in this message today, we will talk about a significant event that happened in Wesley's life. And it actually came as the result, well, of God was the result, God at work in him. But it was, the book of Romans was significant in his shift, in, in moving from the head to the heart. But it wasn't just Wesley, when we look at the history of the church, Time and time again, leaders within the church were transformed as they were reading the book of Romans. Martin Luther, book of Romans was instrumental in Luther's understanding that it's not by works. It's not good works. It is by grace that we are saved. Luther wrote the preface to the book of Romans, and he says this, this letter, which is the book of Romans, is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word. We will be expecting that. You will be memorizing <laughs> Romans word for word. We will be checking on chapters 1 through 5 next week. Um, but also to occupy himself with it daily. Occupy ourselves with it daily as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Listen to Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God love has, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes your love is beyond our understanding. It's hard to grasp. And yet at the core, that is the life that we get. You know what needs to be said? Speak through me, to me, and despite of me. In your holy name, amen. It was a December day. She was tired. She wasn't just physically tired from the day and the week of work. She was tired. She was tired from how she was being treated, exhausted. It didn't make sense. And there she was on the bus, riding in the section that was designated for her type, the black section. A gentleman gets on the bus and the white section is filled up, which means if the white section is filled up, those in the black section must get up. So the bus driver asked four black persons to stand and give space for the white riders. Three got up. One stayed seated. She was tired. She would say, people thought I was tired because I'd been working a long time. That was true, and yet I was tired. I was tired. She wasn't the first person to refuse a seat in 1955, but that December, Rosa Parks refused to get it up out of her seat. It was the beginning of the bus boycott that many people thought would be short-lived, but it went on for 385 days. A leader rose amongst in the midst of this boycott, a leader that we are familiar with, a pastor at heart and by training, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In late January, he found himself in a place where it was becoming the norm. The number of threats he received on a daily basis Death threats, death threats in the tens, up to 40 some days, he would receive threats upon his life. And one January night, new on his journey of being seen as the leader of the civil rights movement, he received a call. It woke him up, said, they were going to kill him and his family. He hung up the phone and he went into his kitchen. He started a pot of coffee. And he began to wrestle with God. Because at the core, that's what he had to do. His life was in danger. His wife's life was in danger. His kids' life were in danger. He hadn't intended to lead this movement But there he was. And what was he to do? And he had moments with God. In the midst of his doubts. In the midst of his wonderings. And this is how he describes the moment. Something said to me, you can't call on daddy now. He's up in Atlanta, 175 miles away. You can't even call on mama now. You got to call on that something and that person that your daddy used to tell you about. That power that can make a way out of nowhere. I discovered then that religion had to become real to me and I had to know God for myself. Religion had to become real. He had to know God himself. 
Have you ever been in a crisis of faith where all your head knowledge was not enough? Have you ever been in a crisis of faith? I read a definition that says a crisis of faith is a painful experience in a Christian's life when he or she begins to doubt his or her beliefs, causing grief and confusion for the individual as well as a sense of disconnection from God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in the doubt and confusion and the disconnection? Are you there now? You see, a crisis of faith provides turning points of transformation rooted in our powerlessness, God's love, and in faith. Have you been there? John Wesley got there. John Wesley was an incredibly educated man. He attended Oxford. He knew all he needed to know or a lot of what he needed to know about God. He was ordained as an Anglican priest. He read books and he gained from that. And that is good. I love to read books. I love to gain knowledge. What about you? Wesley had all of this head knowledge, and he decided that God was calling him to be a missionary in Georgia, that he was going to convert the Native Americans and colonists in the colony of Georgia. His writings tell us that he also believed he was going to save his own soul. So he boarded a ship with his brother Charles, and they headed to Georgia. It was about a three-month journey, and storms were a part of the journey. On one particular day, as the storm rocked the boat, as the passengers feared for their life, Wesley observed something. He observed that he was fearing that he was going to die in the midst of the storm. And yet there was this group this group that was calm and singing songs. It was almost like they weren't in the same circumstances as he was. And he wondered, why is it they're not afraid? What he came to realize is because they had this faith in God that in the midst of the storms, they were at peace. He didn't understand, well, I, I believe, I know about God. But I don't feel like they do. He went on to Georgia, and truthfully, his experience in Georgia could not be described as, an excess, as a success. Both in professionally or personally, he actually was run out of Georgia at late at night because he was charged with defamation of character because a relationship with a young woman did not go very well. And he responded by refusing to give her communion. It's just interesting the lengths we will go, is it not? He left defeated. He crossed the ocean again and he went back to England. He felt like a failure. He was considering leaving ministry. He was defeated. He was confused. You see, a crisis of faith seems to occur in the places where we discover our powerlessness, which is fertile ground for transformation. When we find ourselves literally or figuratively on our knees, realizing that we cannot save ourselves, it can come for, from various reasons but we realize that we are powerless and that we need God. Romans 5, 6 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Have you ever experienced that place, that place of powerlessness, where we don't have enough resources, our knowledge isn't enough, our networking isn't enough, that we find ourselves 
in a place of powerlessness, defeated. Wesley knew that experience. He was experiencing that. Despite all his training and all his knowledge, he feared. He lived in fear. He was not enough. In May of 1738, Wesley, who in the midst, in the, despite of his failures and feeling defeated, he just kept putting one foot in front of the other. He sought the group that was at peace where were the Mor a Moravian group. And Wesley sought guidance from a missionary who was a Moravian. He wanted to know more what was it like to live in peace like this, like they had. He also was attending small group meetings, and one of them met on May 24th, 1738, in a house on Aldersgate Street in England, in London. He was there, he had showed up, and they were discussing Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Wesley said this, while he, the person leading, was describing the change God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust God, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Listen to this again. Listen. Have you ever experienced this? I felt I did trust Christ. Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You see, transformation comes when experience, we experience within our hearts the depths of God's love for us, not simply knowing about God's love, but that we have experienced God's love love, even me, even me. You see, this following of Jesus Christ isn't just about us attending church. That is good. It isn't about just knowing things. It's this in our depths that we know that we are loved by God that we cannot save ourselves, that good works is not enough. That's not what it's about. It's about how much God loves us, about provenient grace that God's love is drawing us to him time and time again. We see in the reading of Romans, in Romans 5, we see this powerlessness and God's love and there's another piece that shows up verse after verse. It's faith. This past week, I referenced, I attended a retreat, and it's part of a cohort. It's called RIM, Residence in Ministry. It's part of the ordination process that during our three years in provisional status, we meet with a cohort, a group that is in the same process as we are. There are those of us that are first years, second years, and third years. We meet in the fall and the spring. We also have other gatherings. This past week, our focus was on baptism, and we talked in various ways about baptism, and part of that, we talked about faith. And what was shared is something that so relates to the, ro the message in Romans 5, and to John Wesley's story, and to our story. It was said that faith is both a gift and a response. We often think about faith being about this response we have to God, but faith is also the gift of God's grace and love in our lives, even us, even me, even mine. And then that's the gift that God gives us by loving us. 
And then what is our response? Not good works to earn God's grace. We've got that. How do we respond to God's love at work in the midst of our lives? How do we live that out by loving God and loving others? You see, a crisis of faith, whether you're Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or John Wesley, or put your name there, it happens That transformation happens in our powerlessness, happens in the midst of God's love, and is both a gift and a response through faith. By faith, we are saved. God's grace at work in us and us responding to that grace. Has it been a long time Since you remember what it was like to be moved by God's grace? Are we walking through the footsteps? We're just doing the deal? Is it time for us to get back on our knees, literally or figuratively, and feel and experience God's grace in our lives? even us. I was raised Lutheran. I believed in God. I believed that Jesus died on the cross. I was confirmed. I had professed faith in God. And I spent about 10 years out of church. I'd go. I was the dutiful daughter. I always say that, and that's kind of sarcastic. I was not a dutiful daughter. (laughs) But I would go to church with my parents when I was back home on Christmas Eve and Easter, I felt God drawing me, despite the fact that I was in a crisis of faith, not just for a moment, for multiple years. I felt God drawing me. I didn't doubt that God existed. I doubted more whether I was worthy. And God just continued to draw me. I ended up at a Methodist church. I was raised Lutheran, and I was like, I'm not doing that again. And it's funny, as I look back, I'm not really sure why that is. But that's how I felt in my 20s. And I made my way to a Methodist church, and I signed a card, and I said, I want to know what it means to be Methodist. I don't want to just be part of a community of faith just for being a part for just the sake of belonging or being a part. I want to know what it means to be Methodist. The pastor at the church sent me two books. One of them was the one that cited the book of discipline, and that was great, but it was the other one. The other one that's called A Primer of United Methodist. It was in that book that it talked about the story of John Wesley and Methodism, that it not just being about head knowledge, but it being about moving from our head to our heart. And it talked about Wesley's spiritual awakening at Aldersgate, when his heart was strangely warmed, when it became for him more than simply head knowledge, it became the stirring in his soul. And as we will find out in the weeks ahead, if you don't know or if you do know, that it was that stirring, that movement from his head to his heart who moved him beyond the structure of the church. And he left the building staying very much Anglican his entire life, but on fire for God's grace in his own life and what that meant for others. Have you had a crisis of faith? Are you there now? Do you need to be reminded that your powerlessness is a gift? Because in the midst of our powerlessness, the power of our God Almighty finds fertile ground. God's love for each and every one of us. A gift of faith that leads to a response of living a life engaging both our head and our heart. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our 
Rock and our Redeemer, we give thanks for you. We give thanks whether we focus on the head part or the hard part, heart part or both parts, that you are our God in the midst, that you love us deeply, and that that love moves us. Moves us not to stay where we are or who we are, but to be transformed by you. Your love as shown to us through Jesus Christ. May we be found faithful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know about you, but there are, there are some times you leave here and I'm like, I'm not exactly sure, or maybe you are very clear on how the Holy Spirit has moved in you and through you based on the music, the prayer, God's word, and the message. May you leave here stirred by the Holy Spirit, not just in your head, but in your heart, to go and tell about this love that we have from God, each and every one of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.